Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for this weekend. And as you guys know, we do three separate videos for UFC content. The first one, which is today, uh, is going to go over who the best plays are from a DFS perspective. Uh, just using the metrics, using you know all the things that we do to figure out who the best plays are. Um, the second thing that we do is on is tomorrow we're going to do a contrarian betting breakdown which we go over just kind of ways to think about betting markets and apply it to the UFC card to see if we can not identify you know, what, what props and what methods of victory are being overvalued and overhyped by the public and see if we can't fade them. And then the third uh, video, which we're going to probably do Saturday morning, if not Friday night, is going to be completely dedicated to lineup construction, trying to figure out how to build lineups to win that uh, 150 max uh, turn. Uh, the, the the difference between what the good plays are and what you have to do to build lineups for that specific, specific tournament is very, very different. Um, so uh, we decided, or I decided, to make them into two separate videos. But today we're going to go over the actual plays, and it is a, a, it's a great card. Uh, it's taking place in Mexico City, and it is a 13-fight card, which means, at least presuming all the fights go off as scheduled, that it's not a card that you have to you know, do a lot of funny business, meaning that, you know, if, if you can find the optimal, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's always going to be good enough, but it's uh, likely going to be good enough to win a decent amount of money. It, it's not like these 12 fight cards where you're, you rate to just be chopping it with, with so many people that you have to, you know, do all kinds of, of stupid stuff, <laughs> which I, I do anyway, but, uh to to get difference to get different but here on a 13 fight card i mean you could you could you could you could make good plays let's just put it that way you still have to try to get unique but you can make good plays um, also uh one thing that i guess to think about and this is all factored into the projections and all that stuff but uh the fact that this is in mexico city adds this other two other elements to it one that there's a lot of Fighters from Mexico, they're going to be there. They're going to have the crowd on their side, things like that. May or may not have judges on their side. Uh, the uh, second piece is that it's being fought, held in Mexico City, which is high altitude, which means that you know fighters with a cardio edge are going to have that edge uh, uh, exacerbated due to the altitude. Uh, in addition, you could argue that fighters that have gotten there early or they're already that are used to the altitude have uh, an advantage in that regard. Uh, nonetheless, let's just get into this. The, the thing you also have to think about with respect to this car is that there are two five round fights. These, both these, the co-main event, the Rodriguez Ortega fight and the Moreno Royville fight are both five round fights, which means they're both gonna get ownership and they're both probably gonna project well. And, uh, you know, you have to strike that balance between is it, you know, is it fadeable or not? Because five round fights, they score 60 percent more. Usually, I mean, they, I shouldn't say that they, they have the ability to score 60 percent more um, because you have five rounds to work with. Nonetheless, um, and that stat actually is somewhat misleading. I don't even want to get into it. Nonetheless, let's just get started. First fight on the night, we have uh, ne uh, Namov versus Eric Silva. And, and this, this, the odds on this fight have just exploded, you know, from whatever it started off at minus 300 to name off is a minus 575. So at 9,100, I mean, just on the money line, it's, it's a really, really strong play, at least for cash. Because again, you know, that big win odds, I mean, you really, you don't get that too much at 9,100. Like, for example, you know, you have Raul Rosas Jr., who is a similarly priced fighter who's only minus 200 so you're going to get a lot of optimizers i think that are going to give you a lot of nine off because of those win odds and it certainly makes a lot of sense but again we're playing gpps we're not as concerned with with how often he wins but but how many he scores when he does win. so at 9100 you know what you need to be have a be a good price i mean is, is an inside the distance line of about minus 110 uh, or maybe a little bit worse, put some takedown upside. And first, let's take a look at the inside the distance line here. Name of inside the distance is pretty good at minus 135. So that in and of itself is good enough to make him a good play. Um, one thing you do have to keep in mind is that 
from a styles perspective, Eric Silva, the big underdog, is the one with the takedown upside here. I mean, if anything, he's like the only, he's like the wrestler here. So the only reason I bring that up is because while Nymal has an inside the distance line of minus one thirty, remember, you know, if he doesn't get that finish in the first round, you're struggling. You know, I'm not saying that you can't get there if it with a second round finish, but in the 13 fight card, you know, it just puts a little a lot more pressure on you to score really high. And the reason I bring it up is that Namov's in Namov's takedown defense has not exactly been tested. So if Eric Silva can even get like one or two takedowns in the first round, enough to just even kill the rounds, I mean, you've already basically busted Namov. Um, so it's just you have to keep it keep that in consideration. You're, he's going to get ownership, and for good reason. He's minus five hundred at ninety one hundred, and he's got a good inside the distance line. But be careful with this one. I wouldn't go all in or anything like that. But we'll get to that in, when we get to line of construction. Uh, Eric Silva. I mean, I will say this is that if in fact he does win, I don't know how he does so without getting a bunch of takedowns. Um, but doesn't really win often enough, right? I mean, he's only supposed to win like maybe 20% of the time. And that's that's not a lot of the time. Uh, let me ask you this. Of the 20% of the times that he wins, how often is that optimal? Well, I don't know. Like, What's his price? His price is 7,100. It's not like he's 6,600, you know? And he can win like some fight where he gets four or five takedowns and control time and still only get like 85 or something like that in a split decision. And 85 at 7,100 may not get it done. Uh, however, I will say also that if, with Nymov's metrics, he's probably going to be super popular I mean, between him and Rosas. So I guess you can get good leverage with Silva right off the bat. So I, I guess you could target both sides of this fight. I wouldn't go all in on or anything like that, but I guess it makes some sense to get some Silva just because I don't really see a path of victory that doesn't include at least, you know, four takedowns uh, and, and 10 minutes of control time at 7,100. So, yeah. Okay, moving on, we have Felipe Dos Santos versus Victor Altamirano. We have another one. We have a 9207K, so the 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 idea is the same. For Dos Santos to be a good play, he's got to have an inside the distance line of minus 110 or takedown upside, or, and we're going to get to this in a minute, like that fight that we identified last week, or was it two weeks ago or last week, if you're going to get a fight that's going to be super high-paced, that can actually overcome uh, some of the inside the distance prop stuff, because it just creates a lot more volume and a lot more, you know, events that could happen. Um, and you do have DeSantos at pretty good price. I mean, he's minus 300. That's a big winning chance here. His inside of distance line is not that great. I mean, it's plus 225. It's actually, it's pretty poor. But I have to say, I mean, this guy's a this guy's aggressive. <laughs> guy's kind of a madman. Um, I just wonder if, I mean, if he could bring this, this pace to this fight, not to mention the fact that that Alta Murano, his takedown defense isn't great. So if DeSantos can get the takedowns going, he could smash here. And, and I'll tell you this, at his uh at his inside distance line, I don't know if he's gonna be there's no way he's gonna be as popular as these other nine kids between Nine Moff and Rosas. So I, I actually think and listen, we I said we wouldn't talk too much about line of construction, but I think he should be a pretty good leverage play here. He's also one of the first fights on the card. Nobody wants to really, you know, get all their exposure early anyway. So I think that DeSantos is probably some good little bit of leverage here, I think. And Alza Murano, look at his inside the distance line here. His inside the distance line is actually really poor. It's like plus a thousand. But how does how does he win? You know, like I, I guess I can't do it at minus a thousand. Right. So, so if, because I was going to say that if DeSantos brings this incredible pace, then it's certainly going to leave himself open to, for maybe some Alta Morano knockout, something like that. But the matches are just too poor. And considering DeSantos is not going to be that popular, I just can't get to him. I don't think. Uh, all right. Luis Rodriguez versus Dennis Bondar. Listen, it's, it's, it's a, 
it's a 13 fight card. And, you know, I think that one of the things you have to do is try to make that, you know, a 13 fight card smaller. And I think this, this fight is a good opportunity to do that. Neither of these fighters have great inside the distance line, like plus 250 and plus 300. And neither of them really have like elite takedown upside. I mean, the pricing is good, right? The 8,200, 8,000, but a 13 fight card, you really need ceiling. And I just don't see either of these guys with the ceiling. And, and then you look at this next one also. You have Ferris uh, Ziam versus Plato Playlas. Playlas. 8,700, 7,500. I presume he's going to be like minus 180 or something. We'll take a look at it. Minus 200. I mean, it's pretty good for his price. But likewise, I mean, this, this fight is not, doesn't really have a lot of events. You know, you have Claudio Puelas, all right, his inside the distance line is pretty good. He's plus, it's plus 220. But Claudio Puelas, I mean, we're, his fights are really where fantasy points go to die, okay? Because even if, for example, let's say we took a shot and took the Puella side of it, his path to victory is probably submission and a particular type of submission that does not come with a lot of volume. You know, he, go, he rolls for these knee bars, and if he gets them, it's not like getting a takedown followed by ground and pound and submission. His submission could end up being like a, even like a first round submission scoring 93, you know, with literally no significant strikes. I mean, it's very possible. Um, or a second round submission with, again, very few significant strikes. So even though his inside the distance line is pretty good, I mean, it's very good, I guess, at, at 70, whatever it is, 70, ah, 7,500, I guess that's pretty good. It just doesn't come with the same type of upside as a lot of finishes go. So, I, I don't. I think I'm off of this. And, and Ferris Zion, he. I mean, if he were smart, he probably would just kind of keep this fight at, at, at range, and just outstrike him. I mean, if he tries to go to the ground with him, I mean, then then you set yourself up, set yourself up with all, all kinds of scrambles and stuff. So, his inside the distance line is poor. He doesn't really have a lot of takedowns. I don't think. So let's take a look at it. I mean, yeah, he had three takedowns against Figlack, Big Lack, I suppose. But, I mean, to me, this is another fight you're probably just supposed to stay away from. All right, now you have this one, this, this Edgar Chires versus Daniel Da Silva. And they kind of had this fight already. They, um, uh, it was a, uh, it was a, it was a no contest. I think what happened was, was Chires submitted him but then got uh then they said it was an early stoppage or something like that uh it was something i, I really forget but one thing to take from that fight was that the silver instead of being his usual reckless self was actually a little more measured about his approach which was sort of interesting um uh he did get a takedown at the end but then he just kind of got got messed up um let's see what Chires did in that fight. I mean, he, even he only had 12 significant strikes. So the fight was not going to deliver anyway. You know, people got upset that it was like whatever, but the fight really wasn't delivering what people expected. But when it comes to the inside the distance line here, it's kind of tough to ignore. I mean, you have Chires, first of all, he's minus 500. I don't know what that noise is. Anyway, he's uh, minus 500 and at his price, minus 500 is, you know, 9,300. It's, it's still pretty good. It's inside the distance, I'm probably pre presuming it's pretty big. Yeah, it's minus 250. So it's just kind of a tough metric to fade there. But keep in mind that he's, well, the bad news is he really is going to need, I think, first round um, at 9,300. The good news is it's, I think it's possible he gets it because, De Silva was a little more measured in his last fight, but his natural instinct is to just really go hard. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's a very, very strong play. And and the other side of this, unfortunately, I mean, De Silva, I think his entire path to victory is going to score really well if it wins. So, in kind of a in kind of an easier way, that where Eric Silva is a good play, like Daniel De Silva, I think almost all of his wins here are going to be in the optimal. 
because first of all, you're going to have, well, how is he better than Silva? Well, because he can actually get finishes. Um, and there could be a really, really high pace, and he could get a real first round finish as well. So I think the Silva is a very, very live underdog. I think this this fight is overall one you want to target both sides. Jesus Aguilar versus Mateus Mendonca. Jesus Aguilar of the first round knockout, uh, uh, Jesus Aguilar. Um, he had never gotten a knockout in his career, I don't think, and he just KO'd Shannon Ross in like two seconds. Um, he's a short dude who's got a lot of fire, and he comes after him. Then you have this Mateus Mondanka, who, who I don't know what this is supposed to be. I mean, he 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 got fed to the wolves against Jerry Bashrat. Okay, I mean, he was, I guess okay. He did get two takedowns. That's interesting. Um, then he got wiped out by Maness in the first round. He was just trying to hold on to his leg or something. It's really kind of a weird fight. I think the Aguiar is going to be kind of like that kind of hipster underdog play of the day, you know, because he's coming off the big KO and he's got that dog in him and all this stuff. And Mendonca has really done nothing, but I don't know. I mean, well, let's, let's, let's take a look at the, at the odds here. I mean, the inside the distance line, I mean, Aguiar inside the distance is plus 220. I guess you know what I mean. I guess that's fine. So I guess he's playable. Mendonca, I mean, if he could get two takedowns on Basharat, and you saw that he was really trying to hold on to what's his name's leg, maybe this is his path. Maybe he goes for a bunch of takedowns against Aguiar. I don't know if that's going to be what happens here. You know, Aguiar just comes forward. You know, I don't know. If Aguiar is going to be giving up these types of takedowns, I don't know. I, my, my instinct is that this is a little bit of Aguiar and, and the, mo the majority of the fights that pass. I don't know. I mean, the the, the pricing is good, though. It's 8400 7800 You know, you can get these guys home. The problem is, I mean, you got you got to out you got to outscore these main event fights, which is kind of hard. You need 100. Um, uh, I don't know if these guys are getting a hundred, man. I, I don't know. Barcelos versus Quinones. Say, I mean, I was looking at this card originally. I saw this, all this upside. I guess it's coming later because like this Quinones fight doesn't look particularly intriguing. I don't know. Like, what are the odds here? So you have Barcelos against Quinones. You have a boxer against kind of a Mu Muay Thai striker. Uh, in, in Barcelos. I guess Barcelos has some takedowns too, though. He did have three takedowns against Phillips in a, in a loss. Um, a good ragdoll Trevin Jones all over the place, but he was 9K there. He was supposed to do that. I don't know. Let's take a look at the metrics here. You have... What's his name? Uh, Jaime Barcelos or Honey Barcelos is... Inside the distance is plus about 200. Ugh. No thanks. I don't know. Quinones inside the distance is plus 200. I mean, these are the same. Why, why wouldn't I do that? You're telling me that, that Barcelos has all the takedown upside to overcome that? I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, for me, I, I think Quinones is the preferred play. Um, so, yeah, I'll include him as in my underdogs. It's kind of hard, man. You have a, a stone cold boxer like that, you know, to 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 get there. He's gonna need a. Well, he's certainly gonna need a KO. Can he get there if it's a second round KO? I, maybe, maybe. But I don't know. It's uh, it's 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 a little fishy. But I think if I had to pick one side of this for DFS, it would be the Canadians. Now this other one, you have Torres against Duncan, and this thing's gonna be a freaking train okay um let's look at some of the metrics here well first of all you have minus 200 versus plus 170 and here you have torres 8300 what is this real i mean you have other guys at minus 200 who's 9100 you have manuel torres at 8300 who is minus 200 this is like kind of ridiculous and then you look at his inside the distance line, it's minus 120. Hello? 
So I'll, I'll skip to I'll cut to the chase here, right? I'll tell you who the who the best play on the board is, and then the best play you're supposed to play. And we'll get into more of this lineup construction. But Manuel Torres is a freaking mathematical lock, okay? Because he is minus 120 inside the distance, maybe more, and he's only 8,300. That's that's a joke, right? So if that's the case, what are we supposed to look for? Whenever you have someone who's a completely obvious mathematical lock, you look to the other side to see if that guy or that gal is even playable at all. Because if, if so, then that gal or guy is almost a better play because of all the leverage you're going to get against what's going to be such an obvious play. And you look at Duncan, and he, even though he's now badly priced because of his money line, he's plus 170. Check this out. I mean, the money line, you could, you're only getting like plus one. You could get plus 170 in some spots. Well, isn't this nice of this one book to give you, offer you 170 and then here to offer you 170 inside the distance? I mean, that's ridiculous. So at 170 inside the distance for a price tag of 7,800, I mean, that's really good. So I mean, that's really good. And the other side of this, Torres, is going to is like a lock. So he's going to get jammed. So Duncan is an incredible play. Um, and I know what I'm going to do already. I mean, like, this is, you want to win? This is what you're going to do. <laughs> you'll play Torres, and you'll play Duncan. And in half of your lineups that you play Duncan, you'll leave 400 on the table. Why? Because in all the lineups that are targeting this fight, and you know they're going to be people that script this, they're going to say, give me 100% of Torres Duncan. If the rest of their build or the rest of their lineup leaves them 8,300, every one of them is going to take Torres. Where So if you can do that same other five fighters and play Duncan, you're going to be just incredibly unique. So. That's a little. That's a little secret. A uh, little extra hint. Uh, we usually reserve for lineup construction, but I think it's very powerful on this particular slate. Uh, Yasmin Yaraguay versus Sam Hughes. Ninety five hundred is going to be tough. Let's see if we can get there. The price tag is. I mean, the money line's fine, but at ninety five hundred, she better knock around the first round, and she's not even favored to finish. So. Yeah, no thanks. The interesting part of this is going to be what do you do with Sam Hughes? You know, because Sam Hughes, she can, she can get it going, man, and, and she gets those when she gets those takedowns going. I mean, let's look at her last fight. Actually, not this one. Though. She wasn't. She did get the takedown. She she got a bunch of control time. She had four takedowns against Elise Reed when I mean, she's been doing it. And I'll tell you this. Like, if she does win, she's going to score plenty at her price. So, God help me, you got, you ha I think I'd rather play Hughes than Uruguay, uh, Uruguay in, in, this, uh, in this fight. All right, uh, Raul Rosas Jr. against Ricky Tercios. We kind of alluded to this before. He's 9K, and unfortunately, his money line is not that great on this slate for 9K, but his inside the distance line is, okay? His inside the distance line is, well, I thought it was better, actually. It's only plus 160? Boy, oh, boy, I, I, I might have to bet that. You have a situation where Rosas is very aggressive. He's going to be going for takedowns. And Tercios, all the guy does is give up takedowns. Uh, this is a – between his, his inside the distance line and his – Take down upside, I and mean, this is a just a ridiculous smash spot. So, uh, yeah, give me all the rows, the row, the row sets. Ricky Tercios, it kind of depends on which one you get. You know, like Ricky Tercios, a couple of fights back against uh Sahabi, he threw like no volume, he threw like nothing at 8,800. It was like an embarrassment, okay. And then, and this was coming off of the fight where he threw 100 significant strikes, two takedowns, this whole thing. 201 strikes, 120 points in a decision. And then he came back against Felice, uh, what, not Felice Navidad, against Natividad. And I don't know if you remember that fight. That fight was a war. I mean, Navidad, by the way, Natividad, he made the optimal in a loss. 
I mean, that's how wild this freaking fight was. It was actually a stack, Tercios and Navtividad, that I think made the made the optimal. And and you know, it depends on which Tercios you get. I mean, you get a lot of volume. You get some reversals. I mean, he could make things pretty fishy. I think for for Rosa. So I think this one could be another one where where Tercios get a good amount of leverage. I mean, a shitload of leverage. I don't know if he could actually win, but it's only plus 180. You know, and his inside the distance line might not even be that great, like plus like 500, whatever. But he's got all kinds of volume in his, at his, in his, in his, you know, in his quiver, right? Um, and I don't know. I'll, I'll take a shot. All right, Daniel Zellhuber versus Francisco Prado. Fortunately, we have Daniel Zellhuber on the slate because, you know, he's kind of, he's a, he has not shown that he can finish anybody really. And he's priced where he needs to, you know, he's 8,900. You know, he doesn't really have takedown upside. So he's going to rely on his inside the distance and it's just no good. Plus 170 at that price with nothing else to go back on. It's just a bad DFS play. And Prado at plus 320 inside the distance at 7,300 in and of itself would be okay if we thought that Zell Huber was going to be popular because you could then, you know, throw some leverage on that. But aside from that, I mean, I think this fight's probably kind of a pass. All right. So you have these two five round fights. And unfortunately, I mean, they're, they're both in play and all four fighters. I mean, we could get into the inside the distance line, but it doesn't really even matter you know, because you have active fighters, you know, Ortega, Rodriguez, Roy Valbrick, they're all, you know, very, very active. You have fights where Ortega went for, you know, 127 significant strikes, 110, 88 even against Volk. You know, a bunch of freaking submission attempts. Ortega's always hunting for stuff. Then you have Yuri Rodriguez, who is a little lower volume, actually. Um, but he he gets into wars too, you know. Um, he doesn't really score all that well. But listen, this thing goes five rounds. The winner's going to probably have 100. Moreno, Roy Val, I mean, they, they just they bring a lot of activity. I will say this, that Moreno's not exactly a smash fantasy score. You know, 95, 99, 80. 80. Like, this is weird. Like, none of these, honestly... I don't think any of these wins, except for the Roy Val win, even get there um, on this slate. So this is actually pretty interesting, right? Hmm. Screw it, right? Maybe we fade this one. Roy Val, unfortunately, if he wins, I mean, at his price, he's getting it. So if anything, you know what I would do? I would, I would go underweight on Moreno, maybe underweight on Rodriguez. Certainly underweight on Moreno. Um, so overall, I mean, th th there are fights you can you can scratch, and there are fights you cannot. Right, you cannot avoid. I don't believe this Duncan Torres. Right? I think this is clearly, and I think it's going to be popular. I'm just hoping that it's all Torres because where I'm going to have a whole bunch of it. I mean, I think he's going to be. How is he not fifty percent owned? given those win odds and given those, that inside the distance. I don't know how. So Duncan's going to be some pretty, pretty health, healthy leverage there. Um, Rosas, obviously smash play. Tercios, I think is some decent leverage. You got this Chires fight, which something about it bothers me just because the last fight wasn't about to deliver, but the metrics are strong enough. You have Zion Puelas, probably a bust. Bondar, Rodriguez, probably a bust. This DeSantos fight, DeSantos could be some leverage here. And, that, and Namov as well. So you can reduce this into some some into as much shorter slate than 13. Um, because, listen, this you know where your underdogs are coming from. Like Roy Val and Ortega are both very strong underdogs. And we identified some others like, like Duncan. Very, very, this is a very strong play, Duncan. Um, and then look at these others we mentioned. You know, you have Quinones, Tercios. He's going to be really low on. You could even try Lacerda. I mean, all these underdogs have a big, either big upside 
or big leverage. That's why I don't think Quinone is quite as good of a play as some of these others. Tercios. Why am I into this Tercios play so much? Well, because if I don't have him, if he doesn't do anything, it's going to be because Rosas dusted him, um, which I'll have some of that too. But you see, I mean, you can play like, and you can even go and play name off if you want. You can go play, you can play these 9K guys like, pretty easily if you wanted to. Like, if you played Rosas, Namov, and who was the other? Who, and let's say you want to play Chirets, for example. You want to play all three of them. I mean, you can do this really with, with no stress. You know, no stress at all. I mean, you can put, you could do this, and then you could do this, and then and then you could do. I don't want to do the whole thing for you, but any of those any of those seventy five hundred we talked about, like Tercios. Well, in this particular build, you don't get as much. Okay, but you see what I'm saying. All right, that'll do it. Tomorrow we're going to do the betting thing, and uh, either tomorrow night or Saturday morning we're going to do the uh, the lineup construction video. Good luck.